So welcome everybody. Although it is a Kitzah Shulchan Aruch class, the uh, uh, Bridge Code of Jewish Law, but I thought we'd do something a little different today. So we will uh, share screen and discuss the oil of Hanukkah. All right, at least a part of the time. Okay, so I won't read the slides to everybody because everyone can read, but we'll 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 discuss it. So the uh, Hanukkah really it's 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 all about oil. All right, so uh, there was the miracle when the Greeks tried to file to file all the oil in the base of Mikdash, and we found. A one jug that was still pure oil hadn't been touched. And of course, as we know, that was only enough for one day. Instead, it burned for eight days. I once taught in Yeshiva where the cook every Wednesday did a greater miracle than the miracle of Hanukkah. Hanukkah was enough oil for one day. It lasted eight days. But she would take the oil for eight pizzas and put it into one pizza. And that was a weekly miracle. So uh, we light our menorahs. Of course, we, you can you can use anything, but ideally oil and ideally olive oil. And we also eat food uh, cooked in oil. All right. So uh, latkes, the donuts. So since oil is the focus, what's special? So the the last line starts to give it away. Oil transcends it permeates so on the one hand it it floats on top as we can see in the picture on the other hand it soaks into things so it doesn't mix transcends and yet it also permeates so it's like uh it's almost self-contradictory now by understanding what what they wanted to do to us what was the greek objective We'll see why all, I mean, there were lots of miracles with Hanukkah. There was a military victory. There were many, many miracles. And yet the highlight, the the emphasis miracle is the miracle of the oil. That seems to uh, overshadow and and outweigh all the other. Why? Because it, it really shows shows the idea of of what they wanted to do and and what we accomplished. All right, so, so um, Purim, Haman was a was a forerunner of Hitler, right? It was a he just wanted to kill every Jew, man, woman, and child. They didn't care. The Greeks, at least initially, they didn't want to uh, kill any Jews. They only wanted us to abandon our eight outdated religion and assimilate. assimilate into their progressive culture. When we didn't do that, so then they tried to force. And when we fought back, then it became a war. But initially, the point wasn't to have a war. The point was just to uh, change us, that we should... Um, we could keep our our culture as a culture. right? They, uh, they, they didn't mind. So for an example... They didn't destroy the oil in the base of Mikdash. They made sure that it wasn't spiritually toho. It wasn't spiritually uh, uh, fitting. So if you took the Tomei oil and the toho oil and you look at its physical properties, it was the exact same thing. So they were happy for us to light a menorah as a uh, cultural uh, custom but uh, not as something spiritual, not as a mitzvah from an infinite God. That's what they objected to. Okay. Now, many Jews, unfortunately, did turn to Hellenism. And uh, they became the, it was a large measure of the upper class. And they tried to force the Hellenism on the Jews. They tried to be more Greek than the Greeks. But there were some people who insisted on remaining true to Torah, to, to Judaism. And really, you know, as we mentioned here, 
we owe a, great, a debt of gratitude to these people. If they would have given in, given in, there, there wouldn't be Jews today. We'd be gone just like the ancient Greeks are gone. Nevertheless, they stood strong. So what was it? What was it? Okay. So at the end of the day, what makes mitzvahs different from just a cultural custom or a nice uh, ritual is that they are a mitzvah from an infinite, from a Shem, an infinite creative uh, energy. And they permeate our lives in ways which you would imagine normally transcends. So even today, I mean, you look at uh, Western religions with the Western world coming from really uh, descendants of Rome who, who at least culturally were descendants of, of Greece. Although Rome conquered Greece militarily, Greece conquered Rome uh, philosophically and culturally. So those those religions are practiced in the church. All right? That's 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 where they practice religion. Yet mitzvahs seem to permeate details of our life, regular life, mundane life. And this the Greeks couldn't understand. Jews, we have uh, mitzvahs before, after, and while eating, before, after, and while sleeping, before, after, in business. Every detail of our physical life can become spiritual. And they couldn't handle this. You know, uh, this is why the mitzvahs they attacked, mitzvahs they attacked was, you can't keep kosher. Why? To them, food is food. It's either you eat, it can't be spiritual. They attack Shabbos and Rosh Chodesh. The Jewish calendar, because you can't have days. A Tuesday is a Tuesday, and all of a sudden it's a Yom Tov and it's a holy day. How does that work? How does Friday uh, a regular day, and then Friday is uh, and then Shabbos is is holy? You know, how can your holiness come into weekdays? So these are the kinds of things. This is why they they attack these specific mitzvahs. So they, they couldn't handle, in, in their mindset, they couldn't handle the, this merging of spirituality and mundane life. And, uh, you know, this is really represented by the oil. The oil, on the one hand, transcends, it floats to the top. On the other hand, it soaks in, it permeates everything. So that's why we have the, we celebrate with oil. The question is, can we just use any oil? What are our options? So, luckily, we learned we learned last week we can use any oil. However, ideally, we want to use olive oil, shem and zayas, for one reason is that there is a uh, that's the miracle. The miracle happened with olive oil. So, by using olive oil, it reminds us of the miracle. Better reminds us of the miracle. But if if the if we don't have olive oil, we can for sure use any other kosher oil. Now there is an opinion that we we follow in the first place, the chatchil in the first place, that for any of the six hundred thirteen mitzvahs of the Torah, if we have an option to source them from a kosher source or a non kosher source, we should really use a kosher source. So. Let's take shofar as an example. And it happens to be that the only animals that you can make a shofar from is a kosher animal. So it's a moot point. But in theory, if there was an animal, a non-kosher animal that could have such a horn, we would have the mitzvah to use uh, from a kosher animal when available. So there is a discussion, though, a mitzvah durabonin, a mitzvah from our sages, like Hanukkah, do we also have to follow this? In other words... Do we need to use kosher oil in the first instance? So there's discussion. And we answer that really you can. You can use, if need, ideally use olive oil. If not olive oil, some other form of kosher oil or wax. And if there's not, you could use a non-kosher animal, and uh, sorry, a non-kosher oil, unless it's a specific type of non-kosher called osa bahano, means forbidden to have benefit. An example is milk and meat. 
milk and meat mixed together, mixed together is not only you can't eat it, but you can't even have benefit from it. So you can't sell it. You can't have any benefit from its use. Other than kosher, even a pig, a person allowed to have benefit from a pig. A person uh, uh, has a pig and it, and it died or something, you can feed it to his dog. If you have milk and meat mixed together, you can't feed it even to a stray dog because you, you're getting benefit from it, even though it's not your dog, but you feel good that you fed a stray animal that was otherwise hungry. So you have to feed it something else. So if it's milk and meat or chomets that was left over, Pesach, these things are forbidden for benefit. So it's not because they're forbidden for benefit we can't use it for a mitzvah, because a mitzvah is not a individual's benefit. Right? So uh, as we said, if there's uh, not kosher, if they, we don't have a kosher oil, we can use a non-kosher. The problem with something that's forbidden for benefit is that halakhically, it doesn't exist for you. Since you can't have any benefit from it, um, for your purposes, it's not there. So therefore, it doesn't have any volume, halakhically. So another example of this would be something that we can't do today, but it's, it's, it's discussed in the Mishnah, so we give an example of a Ir Hanidachas. And Ir Hanidachas is a city in Israel where the overwhelming majority of the city worshipped idols. And that city has to be destroyed. And everything in the city has to be destroyed. So the Mishnah discusses about using a lula branch from that city. Now, you can't do the mitzvah with a lula branch from that city. Why? Because since it's been decreed already that it has to be destroyed, it's as if it doesn't exist anymore. And a lula branch has to have a certain minimum size. And since this is, at least in theory, I mean, it still exists in practical, but in theory, halakhically, it, it, since it has to be destroyed, it's considered destroyed. Therefore, it's as if it's it, not there anymore. So it doesn't have the minimum size. So the same thing is with the oil for the menorah. The oil for the menorah, we have to have enough oil to last to keep burning half an hour after nightfall. Um, so there's a minimum amount. So if this is, for example, an oil that has milk and meat in it, uh, therefore it is also um, not so forbidden to have any benefit. It's like it doesn't have any measurement, doesn't have any volume halakhically. Therefore, even though in, physically there's enough oil to burn for half an hour, but halakhically it's not there, it doesn't exist. So therefore, you can't use that for the oil. By the way, any questions at any time, don't be shy. Okay. All right. So, getting this olive into olive oil. So H compressed there. Now we have a custom that on um, Hanukkah we have foods made in oil. You know the most famous latkes. You know like a fried uh, vegetable donut. You know normally in Europe they normally use potatoes because people were poor potatoes were cheap. But um, various places in the world, you know, uh, all kinds of things we use: leeks, zucchinis. Uh, all kinds of vegetables and uh, yeah, donuts, right? So in in Israel, sufganiot they call them. You know, in uh, in Europe they call them in Yiddish ponchkas. Right? Ponchkas are the are the the Hanukkah donuts. So the Gemara tells us there are five things that help us remember our Torah learning. Okay, one of the five things that help us remember learning Torah is consuming olive oil. Right? So anyone having problem remembering some of the classes, add more olive oil to your diet, God willing. It'll help. However, the Gemara there also mentions five things that help us forget our learning quicker, God forbid. And uh, I always try to avoid these things. 
because I don't know about you, but I have enough t trouble remembering what I learned. I don't need any help to forget. Right? So uh, one of the five things that helps you forget your learning are olives. So this is, by the way, there's a, uh, uh, I don't know if custom is the right word, but a practice that we do that when we open a thing of olives, when we eat olives, you pour some olive oil over them. So the olive oil counteracts, the olive oil which helps us remember our learning, counteracts the olive which makes us forget our learning. You don't have to, even for a whole jar, you only need to pour a little drop, but it's something, it's something you don't do now, it's something worth starting. So what happened was like this. So the, uh, the, the Greeks, what they wanted to do was they wanted us to forget our Torah learning. They wanted us to forget our spirituality. They were, so to speak, taking on the the role of the olive. And what happened and through our self-sacrifice and eventually this miracle of the olive oil, it's, so to speak, we we crushed that olive, that energy that we're trying to uh, pose on us and we turn into olive oil and ensuring that that our Judaism is never forgotten so based on this although generally you know uh, we have our fried foods in whatever oil but if possible certainly much better to use olive oil you know I don't know if, how, if, if olives taste if uh, donuts taste differently if they're cooked in olive oil or a different oil but uh, if possible, always try and use uh, uh, olive oil. All right. Now, now, once we're eating foods made in oil, do some have advantages over others? So we are now going to have a not a debate, not which one tastes better, but a debate with a there's an advantage, the ponchkas, the donuts over the latkes. Right, does one have advantage of the other? So we're going to see actually that uh, that there is. So the the Yavonim, the Greeks, they ended up they take they took over the base of Mikdosh, and they turned it into a temple to the Greek uh, god of Apollo, and they offered pigs on the altar to the god of Apollo, and uh, eventually we took it back. Base of Mikdosh, we were able to get control of the uh, Temple Mount once again. And most things had to be cleaned. Some things had to be taken to the mikveh. But pretty much everything could be fixed. One thing that could not be fixed was the altar, the Mizbeach. Right, the, once the altar, the altar wasn't something that could be titled to the mikveh, to be dunked to the mikveh. Um, and yet, it had been used for auto worship. So they had to, they took it apart, they buried those stones, and they had to make a new altar. So one of the ideas of Hanukkah is the, especially now that we're in exile again with a destroyed base of Mikdash, without a base of Mikdash, we express sorrow on the destruction of the altar, the Mizbeach, and we also want to ask Hashem to rebuild it. To rebuild the base of Mikdash. To rebuild the altar. So, the only bracha that mentions the Mizbeach, the altar, is the Allah Michia. It's what we say after after uh, non-bread products that are made of grain. So if we eat the ponchkas, the donuts, the sufganiot, as an example, or the seven species uh, of the fruit, or, or um, you know, wine, one of the seven species. So in benching, in the grace after milk, the official after, after washing for bread, we mentioned Sion, which you shall I am, and the, and the Malchus are based of it, the returning the kingship of King David, but we don't mention the altar. And brain the fashes, which you would say after latkes, the after blessing. We also don't mention altar. So the alamichia, 
which we'll say after the donuts, is the only one that we mentioned the altar, the Mizbeach. So therefore, uh, others, and it's, it's brought by Rabbi Shlomo Zalman Orbach, was one of the uh, uh, primary luck authorities of the previous generation. He said that we should make actually a point of eating donuts, particularly. So uh, therefore, you see, in a certain respect, donuts beat latkes. So if you're wondering, you know, what's the, what's the story? What's the best thing to sink into a donut? Your teeth. So if you're wondering whether you should eat a donut or a latke, so if you have both, have both. Why not? But if not, donuts win. Because after blessing, we mentioned the, uh, the altar. Okay. So, oils. So we did mention this from the Shulchan Aruch last week. Um, at respect for the mitzvah, you can't use bad smelling oil. So I uh, couldn't use kerosene, even though kerosene burns well. Um, sometimes too well. You have to be careful. But, you know, people, you know, do these small little kerosene lamps. Um, but we can't use kerosene. Or anything else, like an oil, an oil that's spoiled, become uh, rancid, or something's putrid due to uh, something died in it. You can't use that. Now, stolen oil. Now, in general, we don't do mitzvahs with stolen objects because it sort of defeats the purpose. Right? Imagine uh, uh, someone takes, uh, steals money to give to charity. Okay, although Robin Hood made that sort of famous, but it's not really an appropriate uh, way. It's like a, it's, it's a joke, you know. So you're you're going against God's will to do something for God. You know, it doesn't work that way. Um, so a stolen object should not really be used for mitzvahs as well, at all. But let's say a person, the only oil they had was stolen oil. So there's this discussion. You know, there is a view that you cannot use that. You just, if you don't have any other oil, you can't like manure. The consensus is that if you, if that is the only oil available, stolen oil, a person can use it, but they can't say a bracha. You can't say a blessing on the lighting of the manure. They still fulfill the mitzvah in not the best fashion, obviously, but on a certain level by using the stolen oil. But they can't say a bracha because it's uh it's 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 a disgrace to be blessing God while using something that's stolen. Okay. Borrowed oil. Right? There is a view that not only can the oil not be stolen, but you actually have to own the oil. Um the the consensus is that you don't have to own oil so you could use borrowed oil but since we try and do uh, mitzvahs in the best way possible we should try and um, avoid using borrowed oil if we can and try and use oil that we own okay now maybe some people aren't aware but we can't have food we can't store food under our beds when we go to sleep. There's also a problem, by the way, having food uh, in a bag under your seat um, on an airplane if you're going to sleep on the flight. Right? Because uh, the, the tumor right, that we wash our hands for in, in the morning, it uh, to a certain level, it, it, it descends into the bed and things that are under the bed. So we can't have any food. We can't store food under your bed. <laughs> so this is not only food you're going to eat, but um, edible oil. No, not oil. Not all oil is edible, right? If you have kerosene, uh, so that's not edible. We, we always advise people not to use kerosene in their food. But uh, but if it's olive oil, for example, so um, 
if we've kept it under your bed, to try and avoid, uh, you shouldn't really use it for candle lighting, not for Hanukkah candles or Shabbos candles either, you know, any, any mitzvah. But if it was inedible oil, there's no problem. Now, it, there, is an, uh, there is a view, and we're going to rely on this uh, if need be, that let's say you had olive oil. Yes, it's it's edible. It's olive oil. But the person designated this olive oil for Hanukkah. So once it's designated for the mitzvah, you're not meant to eat it. You can't use it in your salad anymore. It's for the mitzvah. So there is a view that once it's been dedicated, it's been set aside for the mitzvah, then... Um, even if it was under the bed, it's no longer a food, and it's not considered uh, food anymore. So that's uh, one of the opinions. And practically, if a person doesn't have any other oil, we'll rely on this. Candles is no problem. Candles you can store under your bed in the first instance. Candles are certainly aren't edible. <laughs> Don't recommend eating candles. So it's uh, that's no problem. Okay, the next uh, next topic we discussed about the oil. There's been no questions today. I'm really getting worried. It's uh, <laughs> but the the next topic is Schmitter oil. So just to give a bit of background, what's Schmitter? Yeah, you have a question. Uh, I would like to ask you about uh, the oil that you borrow, it's kind of something a little bit unclear to me. Yeah. Uh, what is the problem? Is it if, you know, if it's taken from a, a friend or, or a neighbor or a family member? Okay. So why the, is it a problem? So, so at the end of the day, we're going to say it's not a problem. You could, you, you can't, could use borrowed oil. But the, the, the main reason that there's many mitzvahs. That um, quite a few mitzvahs, things need to belong to you. So, for an example, uh, lulav and esrog, you're meant to own it, at least on the first day. So, when you borrow someone else's, they say to you, I'm giving to you as a gift, on condition that you're going to give it back. And some like lulav and esrog, it's no problem. I can I can sh make the blessing, shake it, and I give it back. The oil, once you burn it up, you can't give it back. So, yeah. um, okay. so. In the ideal world, you should, uh, it's good to own the thing you do the mitzvahs with. But at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's if, so therefore, if you have a choice between oil that's yours and oil that you borrowed, better to use the oil that's yours. Uh, even if the oil borrowed is slightly better. But um, at the end of the day, if as long as it's borrowed and you have permission to use and different things you're allowed to, could use it. Okay, and about lulav, this yeah. is another question that I was always struggling with because when we are Im invited to, to a sukkah that you know one of our friends is building yeah. and it's usually a wonderful celebration, they're almost always all guests are using the same lulav and just yeah. saying that the prayer. That's is it a problem? Do do you need to? To worry no. about it. So the first day, which means the first two days outside of Israel, then you need to own it. So what someone should, the way to do it is someone, the person who owns it, says, "I'm giving to you this to you as a gift on condition you give it back." And okay. so when you have it, it's yours until you give it back. The other days is not an issue. Okay. So it's okay. really the first day, which I said is the first two days outside of Israel. Mm -hmm. And what is the so I understand that the foods that people may use or eat um, in Hanukkah time is fried in oil, but why is it potato latkes? What is so specific? I understand that um, donuts it's definitely it's a flour or whatever grain yeah. that you're using. But what is so special about potatoes? Is it potatoes really one special? It's just in Eastern Europe, people poor potatoes are readily available. Okay. So they so they that's, use potatoes. That's but, it's know, not traditional. It could be done out. Well, of, it ended up becoming traditional because that's what people used. But today, okay. plenty of people, um, you know, last night my kids made uh, it was zucchini and leek. I'm sure they put something else in. I don't know, uh, latkes. 
delicious. And it was, <laughs> yeah, uh, it's kind of makes it a little bit difficult to separate because when you make potato latkes, you actually add some matzo mel in it. That's why sometimes, it's practically, yeah. it's practically almost the same as donuts, except it's just sugar <laughs> and anything else. Yeah, That's but it's so, much less, much less. Uh, it's much of, less, of, of yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, yeah. uh, but this, besides kerosene, that it's obviously not, not the good, good thing to use because of the smoke and smell and everything yeah. else. What other oils, uh, you know, uh, oil, the oil that went rancid. I mean, see, today we don't really have so much around, but it used to be when people didn't have electric lights, people mm -hmm. would, would have the cheapest thing possible to uh, to light up their homes, and yeah, man, because... and many of them, you know, weren't weren't <laughs> very good, you know. So, uh, um, you know, and thank God today we live a uh, quite a much higher standard of living so even when we buy candles you know people used to use like lard for candles mm -hmm. they used to use all no, kinds of corn things oil it could be corn oil it could be sunflower yeah. oil it yeah could you, could, you could again oil. ideally the olive oil but if not that's right any of those things mm -hmm. okay and this wax it doesn't have to be anything special it had could be any candles made out of wax. so um in candles the preference is beeswax candles because they they have a a nicer uh, flame, mm -hmm. they, but in general, any candle just need to make sure that it burns long enough. You know, because it's meant okay. to burn half an hour after nightfall, and you're meant to light between sunset and nightfall. So let's say it's meant to last forty five minutes. So what you find sometimes the small Hanukkah candles, if you look at them, they don't really last long enough, especially mm -hmm. once it's the uh, fourth, fifth night onwards and the heat melts each other. So yeah. you need to get sometimes the the better quality candles. And it absolutely would not matter color or, or no, I no understand colors, that it should no, no doesn't matter. No, okay. No. Thank you. No problems. So another oil potentially is a problem is Schmidt oil. Well, I shouldn't say potentially, it actually is a problem. So Shemitah is the sabbatical year in Israel. Right? So uh, there's seven year cycles, agricultural cycle in Israel. And the seventh year, you can't work the ground. It's it's the earth. You have to leave it fallow and then um, start again on the eighth year. Now, something grows on its own. You know, a lot of things, if you, let's, if we're talking about olives, so you've got olive trees. Um, even if you're not actively pruning the olives to make it produce as much fruit as it as you do in a regular year, you leave it fallow. But I mean, you're allowed to do basic maintenance. You're allowed to make sure the tree is not damaged. So sometimes a bit of weeding, maybe removing bugs that could kill it. There's certain things you can do. In other words, not to make it grow, but ensure that it doesn't die. Certain things. But either way. If you have an olive tree, as an example, olives are going to grow in the Schmitty also, and apples and whatever happens. Uh, even a grain field, a certain amount of uh, grains of wheat or something fall to the ground during the harvest, and some of it will grow wild in the uh, Schmitty year. Vegetables, you know. So, what what's the status of 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 this produce? So, as long you can't have it harvested commercially, right? So as long as you have, uh, as long as it's available in the field for uh, for animals and um, whoever wants, it doesn't have to only be animals. People also can just come and take this this around. So there's apple trees in the area, and people collect apples. So you're allowed to bring some apples into your house as well. Once it's no longer available, a lot of it in the area, then you can't store it in your house, but you are allowed to take as much as you need for that day. Right? Now, if you have a larger family or larger household, you can take more in. A smaller household, take less, but you're allowed to take what 
you need for that day. Now, this fruit, this produce, has a certain level of holiness because it grew in Shemitah. So it can't be it can't be destroyed and it can't be uh, treated disrespectfully. So you can use it for whatever you normally use it for. So if it's an apple, you can eat it. If it's an orange, you can juice it, even though that destroys the fruit. But many oranges are grown only for juicing. Uh, whatever it's normal. So olives, you can make oil um, because that is a normal usage. It's not considered destroying it. But that's all if you're going to get some benefit from it. Now, mitzvahs, though, although there's a certain benefit in the respect, in a certain respect, there is a benefit in that you fulfill the mitzvah. But there's no personal benefit. Mitzvahs aren't, weren't designed for our personal benefit, at least physically. There's no physical. There's obviously tremendous spiritual benefits. And... Um, there are certain uh, physical benefits as well, but it's not what it's not its primary purpose. So the question is, could you use uh, shmita oil? And olives are grown shmita, and the menta oil. Are uh, you allowed to use these uh, for manoya? So we're going to say no, even though I sort of said here yes. If you look at the slide, the answer really is no. But having said that, if one has Absolutely no other oil. So definitely better. If you only have Schmidt or olive oil and use olive oil every year, this year use candles. Right? And avoid using the Schmidt produce. But if someone has nothing else, then they could use the uh, the Schmidt oil. But a person um, really should go out of the way and try and find uh, something else. Okay. Now, next issue, we'll get on to wicks as opposed to uh, oil. Um, so, as we learned last week, really you could use anything for a wick. I mean, ideally, I, ideally we use cotton or flax, but you could use anything. Now, they have these uh, floating wicks. Now, if you haven't seen them, I'm not really sure how to describe it. What they do is they have a small, I'm going to say uh, about an inch long, maybe less. Uh, it's cotton, but they've coated it in wax, so it looks like a looks like a mini red licorice stick. You know, it's like a very small red wax, and there's a little bit of cork with a hole, and uh, you put this wick in the hole, and you put it on top, and it makes a floating wick. So um, when these first came out, there was a whole halakhic discussion. Could you use them? Why not? What, what's the problem? Problem number one is that when you light them, you don't start drawing up the oil into the wick until all the wax is burnt. So as we know, we have to light a lamp that has enough fuel, whether it's whether it's oil or candles, to burn half an hour after nightfall. Now, this wax probably burns for a minute. Then it starts drawing up the oil. So since it's not drawing up the oil now, there was discussion, perhaps, instead of lighting a oil, a oil with wick, could be you're lighting a very tiny candle Wax candle only lasts a minute. That was one question. And even if it is okay, uh, the best way to do the mitzvah is to light the cotton wick. And at this time, it's it's you're not really lighting the cotton or the olive oil, just the wax. So the question is, are you allowed to use it? Uh, so uh, Rav Vosna, he was uh, one of the... Uh, primary halakhic authorities the last generation passed away about five uh, a little more now five uh, seven eight years ago um he rules that we can use it so you can rely on him i must say i've never used them myself i've always been uh, worried about it 
But there's certainly, he is certainly someone you can rely on. Okay. Now, something we also discussed last week was the remaining oil and wicks from the mitzvah. Now, just again, just to define what, what remaining means, remaining doesn't mean, you know, if I buy a bottle of olive oil and I use half of it on Hanukkah, now after Hanukkah I've got half a bottle, that's that's not the leftovers. That's not considered leftovers because it was never part of the mitzvah. I never used that oil for the mitzvah. Leftovers, we mean, let's say, the that the, it went out before before all the um, the oil burnt, and I've got a little bit of oil left in the in in my lamp, or the you know the candle blew out. I've got this candle, or uh, I used up all the oil, but I've got wicks, so there was actually use of the mitzvah, but it still exists after the mitzvah was done. That's the leftovers. So since it was used for the mitzvah, it was designated. We can't use it for our own purposes. So I can't start lighting it for my own candles or different things. So what, what can I do with it? So I could use it for Shabbos candles throughout the year if I use wicks and oil. That's that's a possibility. Um, what many people do is they just uh, they just burn it afterwards. They just make a little. Well, since you can't use it, so they burn it up. Uh, another thing that some people do, and this is what we, we do in our household, is we uh, set it aside <laughs> until uh, the day before Pesach, right? When we go to light, light our, um, burn our chomets, burn our leaven before Pesach. So uh, so n what, what we do is we, we put a, a few coals, we use coals because that, but to get the fire going, we use the we take the old lulov and hadassim and the rubbers from from last sukkah. They've dried out; they're now six months old, and we put them on top. And on top of that, we put the wicks, leftover wicks and oil, whatever from Hanukkah. And so it goes from one mitzvah to another mitzvah. So we start the fire with the with the oil and the dried out um, lulov, and that. Keeps the fire going till the coals uh, starts the fire easily. Gets the coals nice and hot, and then we throw in our bag of uh, a bag of comets. That's the um, that's the idea. So there are different options, but the main thing is we can't use it for ourselves. Okay. Any questions? Thoughts? No? Okay. So we shall move on. Shall move on. We'll just say one more idea about uh, Hanukkah and then maybe we'll, we'll, we'll squeeze in actually some Kitzah Shechnorch. All right, so we... Uh, um, on Hanukkah, one of the things is, uh, it's, it's interesting, the... The to a certain extent, if you look at all the other festivals, it's it's something that God did. You know, so Hashem took us out of Egypt. You know, where Hashem gave us the Torah, Shavuos. You know, um, Sukkot. Hashem gave us the like, protect us with the clouds of glory. It's it's really what Hashem did, and the Hanukkah to a certain extent uh, is that. It's it's. The oil lasted uh, eight days instead of one day. But it was really as a response to the fact that Jewish people were willing to have the self-sacrifice to keep Judaism going. And so to, to a certain extent, Hanukkah is the yontav of ordinary people doing extraordinary things. So I'll just give some examples. So one of the decrees that the, the Greeks made was that people had to carve into the horn of their ox that they do not have a share in the God of Israel. Now, what was an ox in those days? Ox was your car, your your tractor, your what's what you plowed with. It was your delivery vehicle, right? Everyone needs an ox. Almost everyone needs an ox. 
And ordinary people, they wouldn't do that. They wouldn't even, even though they didn't mean it, and even though the Greeks knew they didn't mean it, but they couldn't bring themselves to be the car into the ox, you know, be like putting a sign on the side of your car, bumper sticker, I don't have a share in the God of Israel. And so they shechted the oxes, you know, and they, uh, the oxen, and they, they, you know, I guess they had steak for a few weeks, but then after that, no one, no one has a car, no one has a truck, no, there's no taxis, no one. Yes. Yeah, it was interesting in one of the articles. I believe I have read it in uh, Chabad.org that in all times, the ox's horns were used for feeding the babies, that they pour milk somehow through that almost like, you know, the, the instead of pacifier or some kind of things that they use for bottles. That's why... They even asked uh, uh, mothers to write on this device that they they yeah. were using for milk to write that they do not have any claims for inheritance of any land in Israel. That's why it was really interesting. And again, we spoke about this once. I don't remember. It was a few days ago that it's exactly the same that uh, Palestinians are actually claiming now that we have absolutely no inheritance That's in right. the land. That's why it's primarily about land, that nobody would have any claims against the land of Israel. And that's what Greeks did, too. And it was another interesting fact, again, that I was reading. I believe it was in, in Chabad.org, that Greeks offered Jews to make a statues. They even asked them to use any of the statues that they have in their own temple to put it in a, a you know, Jewish temple in order to become adultery, you know, yeah. uh, you know, to, to, to use as, a, yes, as the idols. That, so it's really kind of interesting how the history is having almost a repeated type of turns right now, where again, the fight is for the land, but it's actually not the land, it's just, it's mostly inheritance for the, um, uh, in, you know, the to be uh, descendants of, of Abraham. That's yeah. what really made them well, so. To, so to a certain yeah. extent, on superficially, definitely similarities, but I think underlying it's very different in, in that respect, the Greeks uh, didn't mind if we lived in our land. They just wanted to take our spirituality away. I mm -hmm. think the, the Arabs today, uh, really, they just want to kill us. And, oh, God right. forbid. And, and the excuse that they create is to say we're stealing their land. We're, mm -hmm. we're, we're occupiers, and which, you know, right. which is which is the joke. It's actually interesting, you know, um, you know, growing up in a rugby playing nation, there's uh, Australia plays New Zealand a lot. So New Zealand, the Maori people, before they play, they do a war dance called the haka. Okay. And the, and the haka really they use it for all important um, uh, celebrations. And um, someone sent me, you know, not long after the Hamas attack, and someone started it was a few two three days afterwards. Someone sent me it was a uh, a whole Maori group doing this haka this this dance in uh, in support of Israel and uh, mm -hmm. so they sent me first of all it was an interesting video just 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 to watch the haka in support of Israel but second of all it was fascinating the comments I mean there was only a few comments on it but I don't believe it was Jewish people it did, well it didn't seem to be Jewish names doesn't I mean they were Jewish or whatever but one of the comments was. The indigenous people don't look at the Jews as occupiers, right? It's it's all the European colonial occupationists who accuse Israel of being an occupier. The indigenous yeah. people support the Jews' right to the land, to their, their homeland of Israel. And it was just an interesting uh, comment. Um, Not only that, that, statistically, it is almost well-known fact that it's basically people who are under 30 
are, you know, protesting for Palestine to have their rights because they're all brainwashed by uh, universities and their high education. But people who become adults themselves and have kids and understand the wisdom of life, they actually support Israel. Yeah. So it's, it's the interesting, the age category. Yeah. And one more phrase that uh, Rabbi Citron told us, and it was kind of, I think it's really symbolic. He said that the Greeks wanted to kill us by kindness. They try to pretend that, no, they're our friends. They try to help and, you know, to to bring us very primitive people to their culture to really share all of the, all yeah. of the discoveries that they have. That's a, I thought it was a really nice description. But yeah. sometimes you can kill by kindness. Yeah, they love us to death. Yeah. <laughs> we should know in general, <laughs> though, true. whenever that's anyone true. comes to you, love, 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 that's where you have to be worried. <laughs> you know, a few, a few, it, it, two, two weeks ago on the Pasha, I don't want to get too sidetracked, but we had in the Pasha, but, you know, Shechem, they kidnapped uh, Yaakov's daughter, Dina, you know, they raped her and did terrible things. And then they came, they said, you know, they want to get married. So the brother said, you know, if you have a circumcision, we become one people and we'll all become, one. right? And then they went and took care of them and took their, their sister back. So the Oir HaChaim, one of the uh, major commentaries in the Torah, he says, you learn from here, whenever anyone comes to you and says, Lovey, lovey, peace, peace. That's the guy you got to be worried about. <laughs> the ones, the one that says he doesn't like you, tells you what the reality can do with it. You know, it's a simile, and then, and then uh, it's like a similar yeah. idea. You know, there was uh there was a whole um, in Lakewood. There's a whole area of bells for Sidon, and uh, when they first floated the idea, a, a group came to the Bozer Rebbe and they asked him, um, you know, for his blessing. So he asked them, uh, who's making the money out of it? They said, oh, it's not about money. It's about making affordable housing for young families and healthy. He says, okay, all right. But who's the develop? who's actually making money out of it? And they kept saying, finally, finally, they d- said, it's this guy says, all right, the rest of you go out of the room. This is who I have to speak to. That's it. You know, it's, uh, people come, it's all about a fall by house, you know, speak, you know, deal with the reality. But anyway, that was uh, a side point. Back to the Hanukkah. And then, then the Greek said, carve into the front door of your house. You don't have a share in the God of Israel. So, Rather than do that, people remove the front door of the house. I mean, imagine removing the front door of your house. You know, it's just, uh, it just takes away your privacy. God forbid people can just walk in. You know, then we have the battle itself. Who was it that fought this this highly trained, highly armed, uh, and experienced Greek army? It was farmers. I'm not going to say they had no weapons, but they certainly didn't have on par. It was regular people, ordinary people doing extraordinary things and having self-sacrifice. It was regular people going well beyond the call of duty. And that, to a certain extent, is what created the vessel for the miracle. And I think this is, um, you know, some probably, you know, we look at many Jewish organizations, many Jewish organizations um, that people would have said, that'll never work. You know, this school will never take on. Or this, whatever happens to be. You'll never be viable. And you had people who went well beyond the call of duty to do things. And miraculously, many of them thrived. You know, it's it's this, uh, it's, it's often, it's often the ordinary person doing the extraordinary that really makes his vessel for God's blessing, not only at Hanukkah time, but in all times. And um, you know, it's just, I think, a, a lesson for our for ourselves in our Judaism and, and, and what we have to do and what what we need to be committed to do. Um, anyway, just uh, an idea. Okay. 
Any questions or comments about Hanukkah before we move on? Where are the latkes? Where are the latkes? Well, I think you came in after the part. We said that ponchkas are better than latkes. Right? Because uh, you say in the in the bracha in the, you say al mizbechecho, and we get to daven for the mizbeach, which we don't do on uh, anything else. But in God willing, we'll... Unfortunately, the, the, the wonderful upside of a online forum like this is that we are people who are so far away from each other physically we get to all become friends in one group and learn together the downside is I can't bring the food what can I do I apologize alright I think we can squeeze in one uh, one halacha so chapter 15 Chapter 15. Just pass my reading glasses. Chapter 15. And we're up to number uh, seven, I believe. Okay. So I just quickly change uh, glasses. That's better. Okay. I used to have one pair of glasses. And uh, the Tom just told me now I need two pairs of oh, it's a while ago. So I said to him, how come? And he said to me, too many birthdays. I always say there's no such thing as too many, you know. So, right. But anyway, Zion, number seven. So we're talking about saying Kaddish and various things. We need a mini of 10 people. If there are not nine people to listen to the Chazan, to listen to the one leading the service saying the Kaddish. Loyim HaKlal Kaddish. You can't say the Kaddish at all. Ki kol davak kedusha. Because every davar shib kedusha, something we said that's a holy thing that needs to be recited with them. You can't have less than 10. You can't do it without a minion. So what's the definition of 10? One person saying, nine answering or listening, responding, so you don't need 10 plus the guy doing it. It's 10, including the person who's uh, leading. Nevertheless, let's say one of them is in the middle of the Shemar Esrei, the Amidah, so he can't answer. He's present, but he's in a part of davening where he can't respond to the Kaddish. Even though he is unable to respond to their um, Kaddish, but Staref, you can still combine him, can still include him in the quorum. But then the Shnaim Shloish of Arba, this even works for two, three, or even four. Kosh Nisha Rav Hashanim, as long as you have the majority of people. So four doesn't, four leaves you with six. Ideally, really should have seven. So you got the majority of the answers. So the fact that they can't respond as long as they're there, that doesn't stop you from, from saying Kaddish. But if one of them is sleeping, so dozing off is not a problem. He is sleeping, we mean like really asleep. Of course, no one falls asleep in sure, right? Only during a sermon. I always say, you know, when I speak in shul, when someone falls asleep, I feel happy I was able to help a fellow Jew have a good sleep. That doesn't worry me. If he starts shaking his watch to see if it's working, then I get worried that maybe I'm speaking a little bit too much. But, you know, then... but if he's asleep, now you have to wake him up. Because someone who's sleeping cannot be counted in the minion. Okay. All right. So, I wish everyone a credible, joyous, uplifting, spiritually uh, inspiring Hanukkah, an incredible week. Those are going to our Smith's program during the week. It should be amazing. I'm sure it will be. And uh, 
always feel funny on Sunday saying good Shabbos, but still, have a good Shabbos because I probably won't see you be- between now. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. On Sunday, you go for the previous Shabbos. Okay. So, so good, good, good last Shabbos. You had a great Shabbos. And <laughs> use the energy to go forward Thank you. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Have a good day, everybody. Bye bye.